run my own venture firm called uh, Timeless Ventures. Uh, we invest in revenue generating companies that are impact focused. And then I'm number two at a firm called Evolution VC Partners, where we're investors in about 280 pre C through Series E companies. And the one thing that all, you know, 280 companies across, you know, 40 plus different industries um, and stages, you know, uh, have in common is that they're all raising money. And so what we're constantly helping those companies do is prepare their materials, meet the right investors and things like that. And in the process of my work as a VC, I found myself really enjoying the process of making decks for founders. And I used it originally as a way to get in good with founders, ingratiate ourselves with founders ahead of their upcoming rounds. Um, I had you know a deck that I had helped create and then Afterwards, the round was oversubscribed, but he still made room for, you know, our firm's tiny check in that round because we had helped, you know, make that deck. And so it was originally this way to build relationships with founders. Over time, as, you know, over time, we turned that into, hey, why don't we do that for other founders? And we didn't even have a website for the first few months of this business because we really just did this as a side thing where we would just meet founders and say, hey, we'll make your deck. All of a sudden, more VC firms, accelerator programs, um, even investment banks and institutions, you know, large financial institutions started reaching out to saying, hey, can you do this for us? And so we needed to decide how we were going to scale the business. Um, we decided at that point, maybe it's time to make a website. Um, and just like that, Deco was really born. And what we did is we took what we loved about Deco, which was creating these relationships with founders, aside from just creating the pitch deck, diving in with these founders, getting to know their businesses inside and out, and brought that to other VCs and said, hey, do you want to make decks for founders? Because we know that Series C, Series D, Series E companies, they all have investors who make decks for them, or they have investment banks, or they have internal pork dev teams. They have these resources to create these incredible investor materials. But you go to early stage, you go to C, pre-seed, Series A, even Series B you don't have those resources internally. It's the founders still making these themselves. And every second that you're spending making your deck or you're spending spending planning for your raise and all of that is time you're taking away from building value at your company and building value for either your existing investors or the investors that are going to join. And so you saw this scenario of founders, you know, struggling to understand what's going on inside of a VC's head and what they're interested in, especially considering that is, I mean, I'm sure you guys all know this, that is changing constantly. Um, but separately, taking time away from the business that they started to go do it. At the 280 portfolio companies we have at Evolution, there is not one founder there that we are smarter than in their industry. That is not what we ever try to do. And a good VC knows that, that the best founders go out and launch their businesses and a good VC gets out of their way. Similarly, they're probably not better VCs than us because they're not thinking about that in the same way we're not thinking about their business. And so that extends to every single company across every single stage, seed, pre-seed, series A, series B and beyond. Your role is supposed to be to focus on growing your business. And so we took that and we said to other VCs, do you want to work on this with founders as well? And they all said yes. And now we've built a large, expansive network of active VCs who create your decks for you with specific industry expertise. And so you may be a productivity software, or you may be in the optical space, or you may be you know, generating breakthrough cancer treatments, uh, cancer treatment technology. Each one of these are things that we have dedicated principles for who are active VCs, who invest in these types of deals and will create the kind of decks that they want to see cross their desk. So that for you guys as founders, you can focus on building the business and then you have this corp dev team equivalent to that of a Series C, Series D company in your back pocket, early stage. Uh, we couple that with designing your deck completely from scratch to create these full service decks where we create the narrative, the content, and the design completely from scratch while you go focus on building the business. From there, you know, there's a million other things that we try to do now for founders to support their raise, but I could, you know, talk about Deco for hours. That's the core of what we do. Um, you know, Jason, why don't I pause here um, and see if either anyone has any questions or I could dive into some tips, whatever makes the most sense. Yeah, what I'd like to just you know, put it out there. If anyone has any questions on on Robert's background, uh, by all means, jump in and, and ask or specifically about Get Deco. 
Um, give it a second. No. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do here is, um, you know, when it comes to like, you know, one, the, the ecosystem you built is, I think, incredibly unique and different than the other services. And having been a serial founder, I've raised, you know, 40 million for multiple companies myself. Um, the deck is always what founders get hung up on the absolute mm -hmm. most. They spend the most time doing it, but then they get too close to it and they either fill with a bunch of, you know, uh, garbage that shouldn't be there. Cause you know, if you agree with me, basically the number one purpose of your deck is to land a meeting with a VC, not to get an investment. You know, a VC is not going to invest on you solely on your deck. Um, you know, what would be some of the you know tips or structures that you would recommend? Um, you know, for founders kind of working on their first uh, deck or like on the maybe the the thirtieth iteration as well, because that's right. often you know it's like deck V thirteen. You know, is often what you'll see uh, from a lot of founders. July underscore twenty twenty two. Yeah. Or V68. Yeah. You got all the different folders storing, you're like trying to find wait, yeah. which the was that? Or like, you know, for this VC, you got all the iterations. You know, I guess what would be some of your your tips to kind of help give more focus uh for the founders and what really matters on a deck and mm -hmm. kind of help eliminate some of the myths or you know, time wasters that uh often founders will will kind of fall into the rabbit hole on. Totally. Um, so first off, you said something really important earlier there, which is sometimes you see founders get too attached to their deck. Um, I remember when, before I started my first company, I was raising money for other companies and I had, you know, little to no trouble necessarily explaining those stories. Um, I got the core of what mattered about it and was excited about it and was able to share other people's stories. When I came to raising money for my own company for the first time, I was a mess. I was fumbling everywhere in the meetings because I was too stuck in the details. I didn't think about you know, zooming out and going back to the way that I used to speak about companies that I used to help raise money with and for. Um, and so a big first tip I'd say is ask someone else to describe your business. Um, start off there. Ask someone, hey, what do you really think I do? And hear what they have to say about that, because you'd be surprised. Um, it may not be all of the detail, but they'll get pretty far and they might say it in a way that actually really simplifies the business really well. Um, you know, I, I still have trouble explaining what Deco is to people um, and especially some of the new things we're building because I have, you know, I know how it's done. I know what the offering is to founders. I know what the offering is for investors. I know how much it's supposed to cost. I know the timeline. I know all these other things. But what I don't know is what other people think we do. And so I like to ask people that to start because that gives you the simplest explanation. Sometimes for fun, I'll also like sit down one of my nieces or nephews and try to explain something to them because they're, you know, anywhere from one to, to, to 12 years old. And so if I could get them to understand it and stay interested, Jason, I know you are on mute, but bless you. Um, uh, you know, if I could get them to understand it, then I know, okay, great. I've got the core of, you know, the story that I'm trying to tell. Um, so one tip would be that get an outside perspective early on what your business is. Um, the next thing I, say is abandon the Y Combinator structure for a deck, or sorry, the Sequoia Capital structure for the deck. You know, the one problem, solution, how it works, market overview, this, that, the other thing, and you know, that exact specific order and all of that. Get rid of that. Um, what you're doing in that scenario is you are shoehorning your business into a format that people are already bored of. And right now, as an investor, I see dozens of decks a day, and that's on a day that I'm not trying to. And so the way that I'm seeing those decks is I could be on a Zoom right now. I don't have my email open on another screen, but on most Zooms, I'd be lying if I said I did it, where a deck will pop in out of the corner of my eye, and I'll take, quickly take a look and say, okay, that's interesting, and I'm gonna look at that for later, or eh, not interested. You have about five seconds of my attention in that scenario. So if you're trying to first explain the problem and then explain the solution and this and that and the other thing, before I really know why I should be interested in your business, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose interest quickly. Um, simply put, investors see too many deals for them to want to be walked through everything every single time. And so what I like to tell founders to do is to create on the first page, think about what's the hook? What is your call to credibility? Do you have 
do you, are, are you already live in market with revenue as a pre-seed or seed stage company? That's awesome. If you are, I want to see that slide one, bullet point one, because that tells me you know who your customer is, you know where your next meal is coming from, and you know, you know, you know how to make a dollar. And your market, why you, why you may not have proven scalability for product, product market fit yet, we do have early interest that there's a market for what you're doing, uh, or early proof that there's a market for what you're doing. So find the core. Maybe you have really strong intellectual property and patents to protect it. Fantastic. Maybe you have press. Maybe you have um, you know strong enterprise contracts with logos that are worth showing, or you have grant funding from Google or NASA or whatever it is. All whatever you think is the most exciting thing about the business. And again, ask other people what they think is the most exciting. Take that and put it up front. It does not matter if you repeat that later on in the day, which would bring me to point number three, which is your deck is not your pitch. These are two very different things. Your pitch is very much a conversation and a story. And I'd be surprised if your deck is even on the screen during your pitch to an investor. There's a reason for that. Investors want to build relationships with you. So there, they're going to be much more interested in your story, your personal anecdote about you know, how you were working at this company before you noticed the problem that you want to go solve and want to go launch this company. When you're building a deck, it's actually much more, um, let's call it practical. And it's much less, um, it's much less, here's my life story that's driven me to build this business. It's more, here's what matters about this company and here's, here's why this is going to be a billion dollar business because of it. And what I'm using the deck for, chances are, is to start to put together a memo, to decide whether or not I'm interested in your business, uh, to put together questions I might have for our pitch. These are the things that I'm actually using the deck for or sharing it internally with friends or co-investors. And so to do that, your deck now has to talk while you're not in the room. And so your deck should always be data driven, should always have everything being quantified with primary sources cited so that investors have everything they need to pick up and move. What you want to avoid is a slide like our story. And it's the, you know, that, you know, four paragraphs of everything that you had done to lead you up to this business. No one is reading that. Instead, talk about the market opportunity and the market timing, because that's something that I'm going to factor right into my memo, probably copying and pasting it out of your deck. And so a good deck will do exactly that and talk while you're not in the room. Um, I could keep going on some more tips. Why don't I pause there on those three tips and see if anyone has any questions. So tip number one being get outside perspectives on your business. Tip number two, abandon the typical structure of a pitch deck uh, to find the core of what makes your business exciting and lead with that and tell your story around that. And then three, um, make sure your deck is not telling an ideological case for your business, but rather a data-driven case for your business that turns itself or lends itself to a memo or sharing a deal around with others. If there's no questions, I can move on, but why don't I pause there for any? I actually have a question. So this is really in line with what I've been hearing. Um, so if you're sending a deck out to somebody, don't send them the 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 sequoia right that here's the problem here's the solution um so i've been kind of told to think about it as like a teaser deck which is kind of what you're talking about um somebody made suggestion that the best way to do a teaser deck is to do one like with loom where you're you have maybe three slides four slides and you're talking to them and you're doing it in like less than three minutes do you think that's an interesting um creative approach it, it's definitely, I wish you could ask me this in a few months because we're actually building our own platform that um, actually solves for what I, what I think is part of the Loom problem. What Loom allows you to do, which is great, is it lets you talk over the deck and lend that context while still sharing it around. The problem is, think about again how I view decks. I am on a call with another founder, I'm in the middle of a million things, or I'm on the subway, you know, and I'm texting and getting a deck there. I am not, I don't want to pause my, what I'm doing to go review a deck for the first time to decide whether or not I have tentative interest in the business. Um, and so what I would recommend is it's great to include those videos. That is a great sign that you have someone hooked. What I would do is 
create a teaser deck as a PDF, send that PDF, bottom right corner of slides that you want to add a video to, add a link to a loop. PDFs are all clickable, uh, and you can make you could you could even make images clickable. So we like to create little buttons inside of our deck that will then click out into a YouTube link or into a Google Drive link or into a Loom video. So you could talk about just your IP or just your you know go to market strategy and have a thirty second clip just about that. This way, you still got the teaser. It fits into how they're doing things. But if they're interested, they can really hear it from you guys directly with the video. That's great. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Totally. Are there any other questions from the from the group? I will say it, it is interesting. Actually, let me just follow up with that. Are you going to tell us like what it, you would recommend like in a teaser deck that would catch your attention? Um, I can. Because um, you talked about the first slide, which I think makes a lot of sense. Like, here's the attention grabber. This is why you need to keep looking. But then after that, what are the important things that should be in that teaser deck? Totally. Um, so I'm I'm somewhat of the opinion that a teaser deck should just be your deck without all of the detail. In my view, most decks should be able to follow a story about your business and what goes through you know, a leave behind deck versus a teaser deck um, is the same story plus or minus detail. So you still have how it works. If you want to explain how your product works, you have a little bit of information on competitive advantages. You have, a, you know, your information on market timing um, as well as the market size. Uh, you have information on your team. All of that is there. But the depth that you would go into would be more reduced if, you know, uh, let's call it one third the level of detail in your teaser deck than in your, you know, full full deck would be what I would say. But the story and the narrative should be largely similar because that's still the narrative they're buying in on, and that's the narrative that they're going to be interested in. Yeah, I have some points to add to that, but I'll let Justin ask his question first. Cool. Okay, so um, quick question in regards to like the behind the curtain information i really appreciate you kind of you were touching on it and then you you move forward you how you summarize the actual pitch deck and like if there's do you actually like put that in a pdf or in an email i'm like so so curious uh, how you how you go about that if you don't mind just maybe touching on it a little bit more totally you're talking about like the deal memo and sharing the deal around. yeah 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 that's so cool totally yeah that's uh that's a great question because it really informs how you should be making your deck too. Um, so it depends on the audience. Um, so let's separate it out between let's say one to one angel investors. Then there is angel groups um, slash SPVs, SPV special purpose vehicles. One entity that invest that has you know a hundred different investors investing ten thousand dollars into it. That one entity then invests a million dollars onto your cap table as one line on your cap table. Um, and then a VC fund, let's say we just have those three as the three different types of investors you're pitching. Um, there's a million other types. There's pitching to strategics, there's pitching to you know accelerators and demo days, but let's let's hone these because these are like the three most common right now. Great. And with an angel investor, um, they are probably not putting together a deal memo. I would be shocked if they're putting together any form of memo. What they're making their decision on is not I need to return a certain amount of my fund. It's hey, I have you know a spare hundred thousand dollars to invest this year into different things. I could either go on an awesome vacation right now with my family, buy that new car, or hey, this startup seems pretty interesting. Maybe I'll put twenty five thousand into that. Why am I putting twenty five thousand into that? Because I want to be able to talk about it with my friends. I think this is a really cool concept. I'm interested in the space. It's something that I might have either experience in or I could see myself using. They're very big on touching and feeling the product. Um, and so with them, as much as you could bring the product to life, the better. Because they're investing because they're excited about it on its own. And obviously they're economic animals like anyone else, but you know, the thing that will move them the most is can you get them excited on the thing that they are touching, feeling, and working with? That means you know, product image heavy, video heavy get them excited on that side of it founder heavy they want to build that relationship with you so they might not have a memo but they might have a million questions and they're investing based on that so there 
think again more on design and more on that side um, than you know in detail models and numbers and things like that. Some will do it because they might have experience in that space, but most are investing for that reason, from my experience. VC funds, um, VC funds are creating detailed memos. I mean, these memos are 17, 18 pages, you know, sometimes even more. Um, now, if you ask me, um, and this might be a little controversial, I think a lot of that is some BS that a lot of these VC funds do to prove that they've done their homework on the company uh, because they have LPs that they have to then report back. Um, I still think the initial hook of any business is obvious across every single investor about what the investment case is going to be for a business. Um, so for example, a VC fund still has to be excited about your product, still has to be excited about your market opportunity, still has to be excited about your team and your team's ability to execute and their ability to help your team. All the same things probably matter to them as well. But the difference now is again going to be the amount of detail you're giving them. So like a like a pitch deck, a VC fund memo probably has a lot of the same things. So what it'll include is information on the market. It'll right. include information on the founder's view of the problem versus their own independent research on the problem. Um, will include, you know, their market outlook, including, you know, how interest rates might affect this business or whatever it is. So like, for example, like I'm looking at a furniture company right now investing in, and one of the people I know is making their investment case based on the fact that they believe that people aren't going to be owning homes as much as they used to because mm -hmm. of interest rates. Um, and so this platform allows you to rent furniture, which is simpler and more conducive to rent to go home, which is part of the reason he's considering investing in the deal. Um, so, you know, those kind of outlooks are what they might be making their decisions on there. Similarly, they might do a deep dive into your IP and into your patent and say, hey, I've independently audited this patent. Here's what I know about it. I reviewed the patent filing myself. Here's where I think it's broad. Here's where I think it's loose. It's, I mean, here's where I think it's, you know, not not secure enough, et cetera. Got it. Um, so long story short, your navigate your the, your narrative will stay the same. What will change is the amount of information you should be giving them. So you might want to arm a VC with some additional links to, let's say you have your market slide and your market timing slide. You may want to add a button that allows them to download an industry report by IBIS or by you know Gartner or well or whoever else. Um, so that they could then conduct some of that due diligence and conduct some of that research and you're still owning part of that narrative as they're even doing their own independent research because you're helping them find that stuff um right. yes similarly you could connect them with customers and easily offer in your deck testimonials from customers plus i like to add in a button sometimes it says like request an introduction you know and then from there that can email you an automatic email that says hey we'd love to meet blah 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 from xyz company to talk more about your product great so you could keep them kind of hooked that way as they're making their memo very insightful you're the best <laughs> hey. uh, yeah and, and the common theme that you're hearing from robert here is <clears throat> ironically how can you make the vc life easier like mm -hmm. how can you make their job easier because in the situation, uh, they just they're bombarded, yep. hundreds of deals, they lose track, and they might have an awesome opportunity that you know you might be a great company, might have everything, but like they had to do one more step, and they got busy and forgot. It, it's happened to me, yeah, times. all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone doesn't follow the steps, like in some VCs, like we have a very specific process, follow the steps. If you don't follow the steps, you're out. Mm -hmm. It could be the best company. You could have the best opportunity, but VC, you just, you know, from a founder's perspective, you're already working your ass off as a founder. You're doing anything and everything. You're having to raise money. You're having to build a company, hire people, manage, whatever. So you potentially might be frustrated because you're trying to make this guy's life easier, but they're also in the same boat because they're raising money from LPs and they have to have everything mm -hmm. presentable to LPs. So, you know, it, it's good to understand that founders and VCs are both fighting an uphill battle and overwhelmed and they're not just sitting on a boat sipping cocktail you know sipping on you know cocktails and living a wonderful life they're also stressed and trying to hustle and, and make things happen and uh it's important that the simpler you make your deck for their job 
then the more information you provide them. Like, but I, would, I do want to kind of bring up on the, Robert's point on the VC deck and how it might have more information. One caveat I would potentially put there is sometimes when founders hear that, they unload information oh. into those decks. And I think the idea of links and citing your sources or buttons are very helpful. Um, but adding to that, uh, I would probably consider, um, you know, you have you have your deck, and that's to get you to meet it. That's to start a conversation. Uh, and then you can have another deck with an appendix that has the majority uh, that you can, like, because you already got the meeting, you're, they're already interested. They're not going to write a memo off not meeting you. So you don't necessarily have to follow through with a massive deck, you know, first pitch uh, with all that information. You can say, like, well, I have a deck with more information. We also have a link to our data room. And, you know, you can have that all packaged up nicely for them. And honestly, like founders, when they have a data room prepped and ready to go for VC, that's you know a really positive sign that so you know what you're doing and you're packaged up and you're going to make that VC's life easier. So there's just some you know kind of summarizing some of the points Robert made, but also making it clear that you know don't don't overload your decks with anything and everything, thinking that you're making their life easier. Jason Jason brings up a good point with the power of the appendix. Um, the appendix can be your best friend. Um, I have no problem with a 40 page deck as long as 30 of those pages are in the event. <laughs> because at the top, I need your core story. I need to know what matters, why it matters, why I need to be interested. Then what you could do is say more information in the appendix. And then you can even add a link and that links to pages 28 through 34 in your appendix that are all about the market, right? That's amazing to me. You've done so much of my homework for me. This is awesome. I now also don't have to confirm whether the market data I find is relevant to your you know, specific subset of your industry. You've done all that work for me and it's all nicely contained in the deck and I'm not lost. Um, but that said, do not overload. Like Jason said, do not overload those slides at the top. If, if, if I'm like visually intimidated by your slide, I will be honest, I'll skip it um, for a slide that's less visually intimidating. And what I like to do after we create a deck at Deco is without even reading everything on every slide, I like to go through and just say like, which one of these slides is striking me as intimidating to review. And if I'll notice like, hey, this one actually has a lot of blocks of text that I find my eye like skipping, I'll go back to our team like, we need to cut the content here by 40%. And then they know, okay, we got to cut that so that we can get that to, you know, get that slide to be cleaner. And if we need more information, we could link to it, we could add into the appendix. There's a million other spaces you could put it. But in your core story, keep that incredibly tight and use it as a jumping off point into everything else that we're describing. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, those are good tips. And, and when it comes to that, one thing I just got off a coaching session with another founder, uh, you know, kind of on their deck, and they wanted to kind of do the and then problem where it's like, well, we're doing this and then we can do this and then we can do this and then we can do this and they wanted to kind of have that story on that first slide or second slide or you know in the first couple of slides really. and i imagine most of you are probably in the pre-seed c maybe series a stage so it's an earlier stage when you're at those earlier stages i i highly recommend you stick to your core the one thing you're going to be exceptionally well at and like dominate and if you really want to have, and then there's all this other potential, or maybe your first focus is in the big market opportunity or something like that, like again, appendix or in the meeting, you know, kind of being able to uh, articulate the, the follow on opportunities that might exist if you are successful or raise whatever amount of money type thing. Uh, just because when you often what founders will do is like, well, we, we want to make sure they know we can do this. So let's add it in there. So we can you know, have a conversation about it, but then what they're doing is they're confusing the story because you just, you can't usually fit the full context for both whatever, how many angles you wanna have in, a sto in, a, in the story of your deck without overloading it and overwhelming it and losing the focus. So it's usually a lot better to go with like a laser focus with your deck because it shows that you know what you're talking about, you're organized, you can articulate yourself clearly, all important attributes of a successful founder um and you're able to get your your point across very effectively and all the points that and uh robert's mentioned but then if you want to have that and then there's such a big you know like airbnb it's like okay you're 
renting out your couch. You know, you're renting out your other spare room. That's what they started with. And then it's like, okay, well, now we're successful with this. Let's do houses. Okay, mm -hmm. well, now we're successful with this. Let's do experiences. Now we're successful with this. You know, they added all these things as they became successful, not necessarily all up front on their first deck that they're going to, you know, change the world tomorrow type thing. Uh, so just want to throw that in there. Uh, any other questions for, for Robert at this point before we continue on? And Jason, I want, I want to piggyback on that point because um, this is an important thing with founders. Um, one, you know, you see a lot of like, the reason I'm starting this business is because I want to start a business and no one cares about that company. Um, what matters is like who your customer is and why this is a problem to them and how you're solving for that. But on this expansion idea, um, it is very tempting early stage. I know because I did this with my first company. It is very tempting early stage to go into feature vomit and vision vomit and what I, in your deck. And what I mean by that is like, I don't have traction. I don't have users. I don't have whatever it is that is making a case for investors. The only thing I have control over is what's it going on in my head. And so I'm going to add in this part of our vision to the deck. I'm going to add in this thing that we're going to do in six years to our deck. Da, da, da. And if I could just make the vision so big and exciting, there's no way this isn't going to catch fire with someone. Um, that doesn't work. And you're doing it as a replacement for going out and getting traction um, is, is what I, is, 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 is my, the thing I have to tell myself. Um, and it's true. Same goes with feature vomit. Look at this. Our product is this, 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 and this. And I have 18 pages all about your product. Fantastic. Why do people want to use it though? Well, they want to use it because it has this, 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 and this, and this. It's like, no, that's how they use it. Why they use it is what is it solving for them? What are the benefits of this for them? Why are they going to actually spend money on it? Who is the decision maker? How do they make decisions and how does this make their life easier? Um, when you do eventually get to the point where you're talking about expansion, the, the tactical tip I would give you is start off with talking about what your asset is that you've accumulated with your wedge. Your wedge is that first thing you're pursuing. So I'll give you an example. At Deco, we have a vision to become, you know, ultimately now the founder's best friend, that outsourced court dev team that is in your back pocket. It is almost going to be like the Amazon Prime for founders. And decks are the books to our Amazon. And the reason we chose decks is that was our wedge. It was our way to get in with founders. The reason we chose that as a wedge is it's ubiquitous across founders, across industries. And this is, if I were to raise money for Deco, this is what I would tell people. The reason we chose Dex first is it's ubiquitous. Every founder needs money to raise. I mean, needs a deck to raise money. Two, it allows you access to what we know is core to our growth, which is our principles, that meeting with a VC and that VC who knows all about your business. The deck gives the VC an opportunity to show you one, we know what we're talking about, about venture. Two, we know your business now inside and out, so you could trust us with any challenges you'll have in the future. And three, we can produce good work products that impress you. Dex are something that can do that. So Dex are ubiquitous. They require a level of expertise, but then it is very possible to blow founders away and excite them. Once I have you excited about our business, right? The deck is now the beginning of your relationship with us because what you really have is a relationship with your principal. That means that down the line, once you raise money, you can now call this principal again and say, hey, we just raised $5 million. I need help to understand where to spend it. Great, we're coming out with resources that'll help you spend your money more easily now as a founder. Or I need introductions to investors. Who do you know? I know these great guys over at Thunder. I could introduce you to them. But you see what I'm saying? You can we start to build that relationship with founders that allows us to add in add-on services. When I explain the business to anyone outside, I explain it as that asset and how we're building towards that asset and how that asset allows us to grow over time. And so when you do decide one day to grow your market and tell that story of here's all the different markets we're going to expand into, the thing they all have in common should be your wedge and the thing that made your wedge work. In our case, for us, it's founders raising money and we're expanding across founders raising money from how they raise money to how they spend the money they raise to how they target new raises to how they impress investors, you know, in during, you know, as they go out to raise money. Uh, and in doing that, all of that starts with our core 
asset, which is our principal, which is achieved through our wedge, which is making DEX. So now the whole business today versus 10 years from now is tied together a little more seamlessly. And usually those kind of things are, are, are best represented with like a, a visual or like where it's simple, very clear to kind of like, you know, see a pattern, like, you know, kind of like it's a, the, you know, different phases or whatever the step might be, but really what you're focused on and what you're raising money on today is to win that, you know, to dominate in that wedge. Exactly. Um, because everything else doesn't matter unless you win that that one particular market. Exactly. Um, and be explicit about it. Be like, this is our wedge. This is how we built it. This is why it matters. This is what it allows us to do. And yeah, definitely represent it visually because then what you could do, I don't have the slide handy, but I, I invested in this one company that does insurance for people who are typically denied insurance um, because of their socioeconomic class. What he did is he outlined, once we have this relationship with this group of people, it's about 20% of Americans that are currently underserved and ignored by insurance companies, we now have their trust. We could expand into consumer loans. Then shows you, that's a you know, $800 billion TAM. We could expand into mortgages. That's a massive TAM. And it, he had this chart that just kept showing the business getting bigger. And it was all built on underserved people who are underserved because of their socioeconomic class and building financial tools for them. It started with insurance and then expanded that way. Yeah. So all, all good tips. You know, I appreciate that, uh, that Robert. I think, you know, if it is possible, I know you're not, I'm not going to be able to put you on the spot right now to show any kind of examples. But uh, one thing that we do after all these calls is we will take this recording, we'll publish it on our, our website for future reference, share it with the network. Um, if you do have a couple of slide examples, whether it's just a single slide and you make them anonymous or a full deck of, you know, what you would recommend as a, uh, kind of what works for this particular type of company, obviously you can't, every company is different. That's kind of what you were saying, not necessarily following the verbatim Sequoia, you know, method, but I think showing an example or two, uh, of whatever you're allowed to share, um, I think would be super helpful. So if you want to follow up with me, um, you know, after this this call with an example or two, that way we can kind of share. Because uh, I think that, that always helps, I think, for founders just to kind of visualize. When I kind of show a deck, like a good deck versus what the founder is showing me right now, they can kind of immediately clearly see the difference mm -hmm. of like, oh, my six paragraph slide is, you know, not Too much, <laughs> not working. Um, and, and, you know, I think we got some really good, you know, very clear points to, to articulate and share and that, that follow up. Um, oh, got a late, late joiner here. Um, you know, are there, <clears throat> you know, with the, the, the couple minutes that we have left, uh, are there any other kind of tips that you think are paramount that you, know, you would want to share with, with the, the group that we have here today? Um, yes, a few. Um, I, and I'm not just saying this because I'm biased towards wanting you all to hopefully one day work with us at Deco, but <laughs> I highly recommend working with, um, you know, the content obviously we handle as well and all of that. But even if you did every part of your deck yourself, the one part you should probably hire for is design. Um, investors really care about design. And I know it sounds so separate from your business or it even sounds superficial that an investor would care about it. But think about everything I'm saying. I am not reviewing decks for a long time. And so at Deck, what we've created, for example, is we've created our own design language we call investor forward design. And it's designed to fit within your brand guide, but so we don't like replace your brand guide and it's no templates or anything like that. But what we do know is if there's numbers on the page, how do I make sure the most important numbers are standing out to an investor who is scanning that page quickly for eight to 10 seconds before deciding whether or not they want to review it anymore? So make sure that your deck is visually giving your eye the ability to catch the most important points on every single page. Because if, if it's not, and if you are not helping an investor do as much of their job as possible, then they will skip it. And if they skip it, they will miss a point that might be one of the most important points about the case for your company. Otherwise, why would you put it in the deck? And so make sure that visually, either by hiring an outside designer or using your own internal resources, if you have them, make sure visually that your deck is getting the most important points to investors up front. 
think about what the most important slide on a deck is and then move from there. What I like to do is I like to make the titles of the deck read as if if you never read any of the bullet points on my slides, you still got the story from the titles of the deck. So rather than saying problem, instead I'll say 286 million you know, people around the world do not have access to XYZ thing um, and are spending 25% their, of their income on alternatives instead of, you know, in, 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 and are spending 25% of their income on alternatives, let's say there. Now what we've done is we've shown, if I've got nothing else from this page, I know that 286 million people experience this specific problem and they are already spending money on alternatives for it, which means that I could probably peel off some of that already pre-existing tan, um, you know, for my solution. Now, in the three bullet points, you could explain the details between the 286 million Ameri you know, people. Where are they? How are they spending money? I mean, how are they making decisions? Who are they? What is their demographic data? You know, um, spending 25% of their income. What are, what are the alternatives today? Why are they not strong enough, et cetera? Um, that is a very good way to make sure that visually your deck is, is hitting investors, but also from a content perspective, making sure that the most important information is right there. Um, and then again, visually bring it to life as much as possible. Um, I'll leave you guys with this last piece of advice. This is the best piece of advice I've ever gotten about making a deck. And it comes from my mom. She said, and she said to me, a confused mind always says no. And it was the best piece of advice I'd ever gotten. If you think there is a way to make your deck simpler, make it simpler. No one, everyone expects you to be smart. No one cares if you use big words or small words. Make your deck as simple as possible. If you don't think a point is being explained clearly enough, leave nothing to chance. Explain it as explicitly as you can. Because again, if they're confused even a little bit, uh, I got to put together a list of questions now for the found. Uh, I'm just going to come back to this later. And then they never do. And so you'll lose them on confusion before you lose them on anything else. Hone that as much as possible. Yeah, I, I got nothing but agreement on all those points. Um, you know, the designer, like a lot of founders, you know, you're short on money. You don't have a lot of money to spend, but investing in design like the vcs i work with on a close basis like they even admit how superficial it is but it's it's not so much superficial as it as it is a, a clear indication of how well you execute if you have good design you're able to simplify things that means you know how to execute in your business to attract customers and succeed so it's not just about the deck they're judging your skills as a leader as a founder uh and as an execute you know executing on your business by the way you present your deck and showing that you know how to invest in the right things um, when it comes to the presentation, the you know the the content and the material. Uh, one thing I will throw in a challenge that I try to to do for myself and everything I do, but also when I work with founders or when uh, advising pretty much anything, whether it's a deck, a website, how if you have a paragraph of text or you have a bullet how can you narrow that down to like less than 10 to 15 mm -hmm. words at most like how can you get it to five like it's a constant challenge how do you go from 40 words to 30 words and then go back to it how do you get to 30 words to 20 words um there's a lot we throw a lot of fluff because we're stream of consciousness we're like typing it out like oh yeah can, you know then you kind of forget about it and that's why either it's good to bring in like a third party like at deco or a friend or you know your 12 year old niece or something to review stuff with them because that second perspective will help you narrow and even just the time it takes for you to re review it with them you'll kind of go like oh yeah i could i could probably cut that out and okay. there's some filler words there i can probably remove those and uh, how can you make it punchy quick and ideally every bullet no more than one line yep. um is, is something and, and not 10 bullets uh <laughs> on a single yeah. slide uh like no more than three bullets typically on a slide yeah well, there's there's guidelines or whatever yeah, rule of three i I'm, I'm a big believer in that too three points uh, on a slide yeah every every business is different uh, and every story is different so i don't always like to say like it has to be this but 
um, those are good guidelines to challenge yourself against when you're working on your deck. And always, always, always bring in third parties, whether they're an mm -hmm. advisor, an investor, a close friend, someone that has some context in the industry is always helpful as well to just go through it with you. And, and also keep in mind, everyone will have negative feedback. Oh, yeah. everyone will have an opinion and it's you have to be conscious of the con the the perspective that they're coming from and the goals that you're trying to achieve and you have to make the decision of what's going to be ultimately important to keep in and keep out and robert i know you deal with this problem you create a deck you're very you're for a client you're very proud of it you give it to them and then they turn it into a freaking deck where they're like okay well the design's there but i gotta add this 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 and they go and edit the work that you've done and add a bunch of stuff to it which could potentially dilute the impact of the deck originally and then the cohe it's not cohesive like with the design that we had before and so it looks like a franken deck and then investors know it's a franken i have yeah there's there's founders like that where like i've made decks for them out of my own portfolio where i've made their deck for them handed it to them it's great they send me back a deck that's that deck with like six slides from theirs that are just disgusting that now I have to then redesign and I don't agree with what he's like really adding in here. But, you know, one of the things we try to do at Deco to avoid that is on every deal team, you actually have a number, you have two VCs at least on every deal team. So you already get two outside perspectives from two separate VCs. So you get myself, obviously, who is reviewing every deck, then your principal is an industry expert plus a VC. And so on that side, and plus our VP of deck development, who himself is not a VC, but is a founder and is rate and is managed massive, massive, massive marketing budgets and things like that, um, brings in that perspective as well. So we try to bring in um, as many of those, and then of course your designer, as many of those different perspectives as possible, but just even alone, you know, you get two VCs on every deal team for that exact reason. So, you know, sometimes like the expert will hand me a deck and I'll be like, this is great. But you're using acronyms I don't understand already and we need to simplify this 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 part um of the business it especially happens in you know deep tech medical devices and things like that which have you know their own approval processes and things like that that experts know about already but you know newcomers don't know or generalists don't know um so we try to we try to get as many of those as possible um or Robert, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom with uh, the group here today. As a reminder, I will be uh, posting the recording of this. Uh, hopefully we'll get some additional material from uh, Robert to, to share and kind of compliment some of this. And also we'll make sure to link back to, to Robert's profile um, to be able to kind of give you guys um, access to Robert after this call in case you're interested in his services and can inquire uh, specifically to him. Um, I know we have some questions, but just uh, we can stay on for a few more minutes. After mm -hmm. that, I just want to wrap with one other point. Uh, we are going to make an announcement tomorrow, but since you guys are here, uh, I do want to mention that uh, on Thunder's side, uh, something that um, we're changing up on, on our front for founders specifically, we have our network, which is free to join, which all of you are a part of. You publish your profiles and VCs have the ability to choose whether or not to reach out to you. And we send them monthly uh, you know, deal flow updates. Uh, but something that we want to offer is uh, give you control as a founder to reach out to founders, to, uh, VCs directly. So we're opening up our self-service uh, option effectively uh, tomorrow for a one-time lifetime access uh, fee. It's going to be our introductory offer, you know, basically one time only um, <clears throat> for the month of January to take advantage of. It will include a 30-minute one-on-one coaching session with me on how to best present your your deck your materials and your profile before you unlock your matches and you'll get all your matches unlocked uh so when you go to your profile now you might see an anonymized match results those will be unlocked you'll have full access to all their profiles all the vcs what they invest in why they're ranked uh higher over others and how you can reach out to them directly through thunder uh streamlining your fundraising process um so keep an eye out for that tomorrow would love to have any feedback uh, you know, on that as we release that, uh, it'll be a one-time fee of $500 and that unlocks and eliminates all the headache of trying to find out which VCs you should be reaching out to. Right now we have about 3,500 VCs uh, in the network that will, you'll be scored against. And our AI basically scores you against all those VCs. And we show you only the ones that have a higher probability of investing in you and taking a meeting with you. So you're not wasting your time chasing 
uh, you know, VCs that are not going to invest or just being you know, nice and taking a meeting, even though that you don't fit into their uh, their thesis. So we're trying to save founders time, money and hassle uh, with our self-service option. Uh, so keep an eye out for an email for that tomorrow. Some of the details are already on the website. We launched a new website uh, this week. So you guys are welcome to check that out. Um, but we still have our free option to be in the network and you know, allow VCs to reach out to you if they choose. Uh, or you can take control yourself and have the self-service option. So that's brand new. We'd love to have any feedback. Uh, but Justin, I know you raised your hand. I think we had uh, one more person raise their hand as well. So um, with that, you know, the meat of the presentation is done. I know we're at three o'clock. So if you want to, to jump, you can. But we, it looks like we're going to have some good questions, maybe some continued dialogue. So we'll keep it open for as long as Robert can give us. Uh, so one, one thing on that, I, I, I mean, it's my first time hearing that offering, but I seen a lot of people charge a lot more for a lot less to founders guys that is like a, that is like an exceptional deal i thought that was going to be way more than that yeah, it's like, what it's it's an early offer for the first yeah for this one month to kind of get some initial traction with it and then based on volume we'll probably increase the pricing or make it a, a subscription model at some point but this is a lifetime access so you can raise it for your pre-seed then use it again for your CE, your series a and so on and all the matches will change as you evolve and grow your business on your profile that, i've seen people charge like a few thousand bucks for like an exported list of investors from pitchbook like guys that's a that's a pretty sick deal like anyways i don't i don't mean to and again first time here, <laughs> he's not paying me to say that i just think that's awesome <laughs> so all right quick, Justin, you raise your hand go ahead yeah yeah quick question regarding the new product because it sounds great with the angel investors because i know that thunder was I guess more focused on VC rather than like pre-seed. You know, in terms of criteria, is that has that changed, and is that part of the new product where it focuses more? Because we're in a we're fortunately, unfortunately, in still in a pre-seed stage where angels would be more of the attraction. Um, is that is that a, a big component of the new product? So we're adding more investors, so both angels, angel groups, VCs. Okay. So the majority of our network is predominantly VCs. Um, we've got about 400 or so angels uh, in the network. So it's a, it's a decent amount, but it's going to be growing substantially. Uh, so that's where we're investing a lot of our resources is um, you know expanding this network and you know acquiring the right data to make sure we can make relevant investments. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Hello. Hello? Yeah, I, I have a, a two questions. One is, excuse my ignorance, but I get a lot of things about Slack. And I, you know, all the emails and the, the notices come about Slack. Do I have to use Slack or can I not use Slack? Because it's, it's not really something I want to be operating in. Do, do, is it a problem if I don't have Slack? The Slack, you're talking about no. a factor community group? Yes. Yeah, you, if, you don't have the community group accessible otherwise, uh, but you're not required by any means to be a part of the community. And it's just a lot of independent conversations having between our founders or you know, people in the network or content that we're posting that people interact with. Um, but by no means, we, we it's not required and you will definitely be fine without it. But it's just a resource that we encourage founders to participate in and uh, you know, they, if they're willing, but you don't have to. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, the, the other question is, will you provide, but for this meeting, will there be a link that mm -hmm. one can click on in order to, they will say that, that's what, are you going to, is it just going to be on your website or is it, are you going yep. to email it to us? We're going to email it to um, all the founders in our community and post on a slide. Yeah, you'll have, you'll get it if you're in the email list. So it okay. uh, shouldn't be an issue yet. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this. I really appreciate it. Very interesting. Thank you. No, oh, thanks for joining. Uh, yeah. Any other questions before uh, before we jump? All right. Well, uh, we appreciate everyone uh, joining us and uh, you know hearing the you know the insights that uh, Robert had to share with us. Like I said, link will be posted and shared with you guys um, you know by the end of the week, hopefully. And you know, excited for, for everyone to kind of hear this wonderful and very valuable feedback that hopefully you'll be able to take back with you and um, you know, execute on your your next. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you, Jason, for having me. Um, guys, again, we're at Deco. We've worked with a number of Thunder founders, but we really are a huge, huge fan of what you know, Thunder's mission is and how they've been supporting companies. Um, 
Jason didn't ask me to say anything nice, but he, he never <laughs> asked me to say anything nice, but I still say it anyways, because uh, you've built something really incredible here. And uh, I'm seeing it work for more and more founders every day um, and more and more investors every day too. So from both sides of the eye, from both sides of it as a founder and as an investor, um, I think this is, I think you guys are all in great hands working with Jason and, and the team at Thunder. Absolutely. Um, like, same can be said about you, Robert. So really appreciate you. you definitely turned some terrible decks into very, uh, very good decks. So uh, that's why we work with you guys and you guys can handle it. That's the best part. Um, you guys have the experience in the team to to do it where, you know, a one-off designer can't handle the volume that we'd be, you know, sharing with you guys. So um, really appreciate everyone. Uh, we won't take any more of your time. Uh, you know, hope you got some good gems out of this and uh, be sure to keep an eye out for uh, the recording and uh, some of the learnings and tidbits from today. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Robert, I'm going to shoot you a separate link to, to chat cool. with you. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. All right, bye.